Hello, everyone. My name is Erin Rutherford, and I am the Collection Development Librarian here in the E.P. Taylor Library and Archives at the Art Gallery of Ontario. Thank you for joining me today to take a close look at the shadow of the year. I am speaking to you in virtual space, but here where I sit and the land on which the AGO operates is Mishi Sagik Nishnabe territory. It is governed by a treaty between the Mississauga of the Credit and the Canadian government, and has also been occupied by other Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and Wendat confederacies. Many First Nations have met in Toronto over time. I am grateful to have the opportunity to live and to work on this land. Sometimes within our library's collection, we hold more than one copy of the same title. Tucked away in our vault, beside one another in clean off-white envelopes and enclosures are three copies of a book of poetry written by Canadian artist Florence Weil entitled The Shadow of the Year. While many know Weil for her accomplishments as a sculptor, she was also a prolific writer of poetry. In fact, we hold a number of her notebooks and books of poetry in our special collections. Today, we focus on this particular published title. Every book in our collection has a call number, and these, of course, are no exception. A call number is like an address. It tells us where a book is located on shelf. Within our library, we use the Dewey Decimal Classification System, which groups books together by subject. Books are arranged sequentially by numbers, indicating the general class and subject matter of the title. Next, another number preceded by a letter called a cutter number denotes the associated name or title. The call numbers for our three copies of Weil's poetry book, as you can see, are almost identical. 819 for Canadian literature, W97 for Florence Weil, and the third copy bears a year, 1976, for the year of creation. The books were produced in a limited edition of 125 copies. Library copy one is number 51, and copy number two is marked HC, or Ors Commerce, meaning that it was one of a set not intended for sale to the general marketplace. It could have, for example, been retained and given away to friends or other significant individuals by the printer or artist. Our third copy is marked as Roman numeral IV or four, indicating that it is one of 10 copies numbered I through X, specially bound for the Sisler Gallery. Copies one and two from our library collection look nearly identical, while the third looks quite a bit different. For the purposes of this presentation, we will look at copy one, number 51, and our special copy, Roman numeral IV. The book in question and in its many forms was designed, printed, and bound by William Ruder at the Aliquando Press in Toronto. Ruder founded his press in December 1962 while still a student at the then Ontario College of Art. Focusing on the book arts, works of music and poetry, Ruder designed and still designs handsets and binds his work. To date, the press has produced over 120 books and 90 broadsides. This book encompasses 28 unnumbered pages and measures 25 centimeters in height and 16 centimeters in width. It is set in Trigenis type, a typeface designed by Warren Chapel, circa 1939-40, inspired by the inscriptional letters on the base of Trajan's column in Rome. It is printed on Hopper Sonata paper. Number 16 through 115, which of course includes our number 51, are cased in quarter brown linen, bound with orange Torinoco end papers and featuring boards covered with Sudare handmade paper and a printed 
paper title label applied to the spine, which you can see here. Torinoco or hen's egg paper is a handmade washi or traditional Japanese paper. It has a lustrous and smooth quality and intricate texture. The sudare paper, a lightweight but strong tissue, is patterned with alternating vertical bands of cream and brown. Sudare means bamboo screen or rattan blind and refers to that striping pattern that you can clearly see here. The 10 copies specially bound for the Sisler Gallery, which of course include RIV, feature different handmade papers with boards covered in Arazuki and a slipcase in Moriki. The earth tones and textures of these papers make this binding, to me, really appear elegant. The frontispiece vignette, or illustration facing the title page of the book, is the first of the wood engravings we encounter. Let's enlarge the image slightly to enhance our view here. Printed in vibrant orange, it features a kinetic bird encircling and rather entranced by the rays of a vibrant sun. Our special copy also includes an additional suite of four engravings tucked into the book. All of the engravings within were burnished by artist Rosemary Kilburn, who was rightly noted by the Art Gallery of Hamilton as one of Canada's premier wood engravers. Let's take a look at some of the additional engravings. The scenes really complement and illustrate Weil's words. Dense and fluid black lines compose landscapes, form trees, birds, rounded clouds, and pulsating suns. All is curving, composed of a forward driving but calm movement, a steady gaze permeating both the written and the graphic art. There's a kinship knowing that Kilburn undoubtedly executed her work in her studio, an 1872 schoolhouse in the Caledon Hills. And Weil would have penned the text in hers, what was originally the 1850s Sunday schoolhouse for Christchurch Deer Park. In one of the etchings, we even see Kilburn's studio. You can just make out the roof line here of the Dingle Schoolhouse. The structure really does evoke both of the artist's sites. The creation or appearance of the book was marked by an exhibition of Wiles sculpture and Kilburn's wood engravings at the Sisler Gallery at 35 Baldwin Street. It ran from the 4th to the 22nd of April in 1976. We learned from an invitation tucked into the front of our special copy that a preview of the exhibition was held for a special subset of invited guests on Friday, April 2nd from 8 to 10 p.m. The invitation here is addressed to another distinguished Canadian woman artist, sculptor Dora de Pettery Hunt, who was a close acquaintance of Weil and her partner, Frances Loring. One can really picture the evening unfolding, the hubbub of a talented crowd packing into the gallery, once an old Victorian home. Perhaps the air outside was crisp, a tinge of winter to the impending spring. And inside, Wiles's bronze and painted plasters, Kilburn's furrowed and inky lines, undulating, drawing in each viewer's gaze. Guests were likely sharing stories and memories of Weil, who had passed away in 1968. The artworks, the etchings, the sculpture, the book, and the ambiance would have generated and rooted memories more still. In that early April evening, as today on this early April morning, someone may have taken a copy of the book in hand, say this one here, pulled it from its slipcase, opened to a most pertinent page and begun to read. Barren wastes of snow back to the sun, his blinding radiance throw, white and cold, 
gaunt pines stand in rusty black against the chilling sky. They are weary and old, like women, when there is but death that may not pass them by, and love's tale all untold. But see, the willow's magic is there. They have taken the light from the frosty air and changed it to living gold. And the maples have opened wide their arms, forgetting the winds and the snows, till every twig and branch is alive with the joy that April knows. And my heart has sensed the coming of spring, and ecstasy floods me, and I sing. I'd like to dedicate this presentation today to my dear friend and inspiration, Eleanor. Thank you for joining me. Stay happy and hold your loved ones close as we move into a beautiful spring. <laughs>